Hi everyone. We're going to start off our fifth grade book club with the book Hatchet by Gary Paulson. Chapter 1. Brian Robeson stared out the window of the small plane at the endless green northern wilderness below. It was a small plane, a Cessna 406, a bush plane, and the engine was so loud, so roaring and consuming and loud that it ruined any chance for conversation. Not that he had much to say. He was 13, and the only passenger on the plane was a pilot named, what was it, Jim or Jake or something, who, who was in his mid-40s and who had been silent as he worked to prepare for takeoff. In fact, since Brian had come to the small airport in Hampton, New York, to meet the plane, driven by his mother, the pilot had only spoken five words to him, get in the coal pilot seat, which Brian had done. They had taken off, and that was the last of the conversation. There had been the initial excitement, of course. He had never flown in a single-engine plane before, and to be sitting in the co-pilot seat with all the controls right there in front of him, all the instruments in his face as the plane clawed for altitude, jerking and sliding on the wind currents as the pilot took off, had been interesting and exciting. But in five minutes, they had leveled off at 6,000 feet and headed northwest, and from then on, the pilot had been silent, staring out in front, and the drone of the, of the engine had been all that was left. The drone and the sea of green trees that lay before the plane's nose and flowed to the horizon, spread with lakes, swamps, and wandering streams and rivers. Now, now Brian sat, looking out the window, with the roar with the roar thundering through his ears and tried to catalog what had led up to his taking this flight. The thinking started. Always it started with a single word, divorce. It was an ugly word, he thought, a tearing, ugly word that meant fights and yelling, lawyers, God, he thought, how he hated lawyers who sat with their comfortable smiles and tried to explain to him in legal terms how all that he had he lived in was coming apart and the breaking and shattering of all the solid things his home his life all the solid things divorce a breaking word an ugly breaking word divorce secrets no not secrets so much as just the secret what he knew and had not told anybody what he knew about his mother that had caused the divorce what he knew what he knew the secret Divorce, the secret. Brian felt his eyes beginning to burn and knew there would be tears. He had cried for a time, but that was gone now. He didn't cry now. Instead, his eyes burned and tears came, the seeping tears that burned, but he didn't cry. He wiped his eyes with a finger and looked at the pilot out of the corner of his eye to make sure he hadn't noticed the burning and tears. The pilot sat large, his hands lightly on the wheel, feet on the rudder pedals. He seemed more of a, a machine than a man, an extension of the plane. On the dashboard in front of him, Brian saw the dials, switches, meters, knobs, levers, cranks, lights, handles that were wiggling and flickering, all indicating that nothing he understood and the pilot seemed the same way, part of the plane, not human. When he saw Brian look at him, the pilot seemed to open up a bit and smiled. Ever fly in the co-pilot seat before? He leaned over and lifted the headrest off of his right ear and put it on his temple, yelling to overcome the sound of the engine. Brian shook his head. He had never been in any kind of plane, never seen the cockpit of a plane except in films or television. It was loud and confusing. First time! It's not as complicated as it looks. Good plane like this almost flies itself, the pilot shrugged. Makes my job easier. He took Brian's left arm. Here, put your hand on the controls, your feet in the rudder pedals, and I'll show you what I mean. Brian shook his head. I'd better not. Sure, try. Brian reached out and took the wheel in a grip so tight his knuckles were white. He pushed his feet down on the pedals. The plane slewed suddenly to the right. Not so hard. Take her light. Take her light. Brian eased off, relaxed his grip. The burning in his eyes were forgotten momentarily as the vibration of the plane came through the wheel and the pedals. It seemed almost alive. See? The pilot let go of his wheel, raised his hands in the air, 
and took his feet off the pedals to show Brian he was actually flying the plane alone. Simple. Now turn the wheel a little to the right and push on the right rudder pedal a small amount. Brian turned the wheel slightly and the plane immediately banked to the right. And when he pressed on the right, on the right pedal, the nose slid across the horizon to the right. He left, on, he left off on the pressure and straightened the wheel and the plane righted itself. Now you can turn. Bring her back to the left a little. Brian turned the wheel left, pushed on the left pedal, and the plane came back around. It's easy, he smiled. At least this part. The pilot nodded. All of the flying is easy, just takes learning, like everything else. Like everything else. He took the controls back, then reached up and rubbed his left shoulder. Aches and pains, must be getting old. Brian let go of the controls and moved his feet away from the pedals as the pilot put his hands on the wheel. Thank you. But the pilot had his headset back on and the gratitude was lost in the engine noise and things went back to went back to Brian looking out the window at the ocean of trees and lakes. The burning eyes did not come back, but memories did. Came flooding in, the words, always the words, divorce, the secrets, fights, split, the big split. Brian's father did not understand as Brian did, knew only that Brian's mother wanted to break the marriage apart. The, the split had come and then the divorce, all so fast, and the court had left him with his mother except for the summers and what the judge called visitation rights. So formal, Brian hated judges, as he hated lawyers, judges that leaned over the bench and asked Brian if he understood why he was to live and oh, where he was to live and why. Judges with the caring look that meant nothing, as lawyers said, legal phrases that meant nothing. In the summer, Brian would live with his father, in the school year with his mother. That's what the judge said after looking at the papers on his desk and listening to the lawyers talk. Talk. Words. Now the plane lurched silently to the right and Brian looked at the pilot. He was rubbing his shoulder again, and there was the sudden smell of body gas in the plane. Brian turned back to avoid embarrassing the pilot, who was obviously in some discomfort, must have stomach troubles. So this summer, this first summer when he was allowed to have visitation rights with his father, with the divorce only one month old, Brian was heading north. His father was a mechanical engineer who had designed or invented a new drill bit for oil drilling, a self-cleaning, self-sharpening bit. He was working on the oil fields of Canada, up on the tree line where the tundra started and the forests ended. Brian was riding up from New York with some drilling equipment. It was lashed down in the rear of the plane next to a fabric bag the pilot had called the survival pack, which had emergency supplies in case they had had to make an emergency landing. That had to be specially made in the city, riding in the bush plane with a pilot named Jim or Jake or something who had turned out to be an all right guy, letting him fly and all, except for the smell. Now there was a constant odor and Brian took another look at the pilot, found him rubbing the shoulder and down the arm now, the left arm, letting go more gas and wincing. Probably something he ate, Brian thought. His mother had driven him from the city to meet the plane at Hampton, where it came to pick up the drilling equipment. A drive in silence, a long drive in silence. Two and a half hours of sitting in the car, staring out the window. Once after an hour, when they were out of the city, she turned to him. Look, can we talk this over? Can't we talk this out? Can't you tell me what's bothering you? And there were the words again. Divorce. Split. The secret. How could he tell her what he knew? So he had remained silent, shook his head, and continued to stare unseeing at the countryside. And his mother had gone back to driving only to speak to him one more time when they were, when they were close to Hampton. She reached over the back of the seat and brought up a paper sack. I got something for you, for the trip. Brian took the sack and opened the top. Inside, there was a hatchet, the kind with a steel handle and a rubber hand grip. The head was in a stout leather case that had a brass riveted belt loop.
It goes on your belt. His mother spoke now without looking at him. There were some farm trucks on the roads now, and she had to weave through them and watch traffic. The man at the store said you could use it, you know, in the woods with your father. Dad, he thought, not my father. My dad. Thanks, it's really nice. But the word sounded hollow, even to Brian. Try it on. See how it looks on your belt. And he would normally have said no, would normally have said no that it looked too hokey to have a hatchet on it on your belt. Those were the normal things he would say, but her voice was thin, had a sound like something thin that would break if you touched it. And he felt bad for not speaking to her, knowing what he knew, even with the anger, the white hot hate of his anger at her, he still felt bad for not speaking to her. And so to humor her, he loosened his belt and pulled the right side out and put the hatchet on and threaded the belt. Scooch around so I can see. He moved around in the seat, feeling only slightly ridiculous. She nodded, just like a scout, my little scout. And there was the treacherous tenderness in her voice that she had when she when he was small. The tenderness that he had when she when the tenderness that she had when he was small and sick with a cold, and she put her hand on his forehead and the burning came into his eyes again, and he had turned away from her and looked out the window forgotten the hatchet on his belt, and so arrived at the plane with the hatchet still on his belt. Because it was a bush flight with a small airport, there had been no security, and the plane had been waiting, with the engine running when he arrived, and he had grabbed his suitcase and pack, pack bag and ran run for the plane without stopping to remove the hatchet. So it was still on his belt. This is what we call foreshadowing. At first, he had been embarrassed, but the pilot had said nothing about it, and Brian forgot it. What forgot it as they took off in the plane and began flying. More smell bad now. Bad. Brian turned again to glance at the pilot, who had both hands on his stomach and was grimacing in pain, reaching for the left shoulder again. As Brian watched, don't know, kid. The pilot's words were a hiss, barely audible. Bad aches here. Bad aches. Thought it was something I ate, but he stopped as a fresh spasm of pain hit him. Even Brian could see how bad it was. The pain drove the pilot back into the seat, back and down. I've never had anything like this. The pilot reached for the switch on his mic cord, his hand coming up in a small arc from his stomach, and he flipped the switch and said, This is flight four, six and now a jolt took him like a hammer blow, so forcefully that he seemed to crash back into the seat, and Brian reached for him, could not understand at first what it was, could not know, and then he knew. Brian knew. The pilot's mouth went rigid. He swore and jerked a short series of slams into the seat, holding his shoulder now, swore and hissed, chest, oh my God, my chest is coming apart. Brian knew now. The pilot was having a heart attack. Brian had been in the shopping mall with his mother when a man in front of the Paisley store had suffered a heart attack. He had gone down and screamed about his chest. An old man, much older than the pilot, Brian knew. The pilot was having a heart attack, and even as the knowledge came to Brian, he saw the pilot slam into the seat one more time, one more awful time. He slammed back into the seat, and his right leg jerked, pulling the plane to the side in a sudden twist, and his head fell forward and split, spit again. Spit came from the corners of his mouth and his legs contracted up, up into the seat, and his eyes rolled back in his head until there was only white. Only white for his eyes, and the smell became worse, filled the cockpit, and all of it so fast, so incredibly fast, that Brian's mind could not take it in at first, could only see it in stages. The pilot had been talking just a moment ago, complaining of the pain. He had been talking. Then the jolts came. The jolts that took the pilot back had come. And now Brian sat, and there was a strange feeling of silence in the thrumming roar of the engine. A strange feeling of silence and being alone. Brian was stopped. He was stopped. Inside, he was stopped. He could not think past what he saw, what he felt. All was stopped. The very core of him, the very center of Brian Robeson, was stopped and stricken with a white flash of horror. 
a terror so intense that his breathing, his thinking, and nearly his heart had stopped, stopped. Seconds passed, seconds that became all of his life, and he began to know what he was seeing, began to understand what he saw, and that was worse, so much worse, that he wanted to make his mind freeze again. He was sitting in a bush plane, roaring 7,000 feet above the northern wilderness with a pilot who had suffered a massive heart attack and who was either dead or something close to a coma. He was alone in the roaring plane with no pilot. He was alone. Alone. Chapter 2. For a, for a time that he could not understand, Brian could do nothing. For after his mind began working and he could see what had happened, he could do nothing. It was as if his hands and arms were, were led. Then he looked for ways for it not to have happened. Be asleep. His mind screamed at the pilot. Just be asleep and your eyes will open now and your hands will take the controls and your feet will move to the pedals. But it did not happen. The pilot did not move except that his head rolled on a, on a neck impossibly loose as the plane hit a small bit of turbulence. The plane... Somehow the plane was still flying. Seconds had passed, nearly a minute, and the plane flew on as if nothing had happened. And he had to do something, had to do something, but did not know what. Help. He had to help. He stretched one hand toward the pilot, saw that his fingers were trembling, and touched the pilot on the chest. He did not know what to do. He knew there were procedures that he could do mouth to mouth on victims of heart attacks and push their chests CPR but he did not know how to do it and in any case could not do it with the pilot who was sitting up in the seat and still strapped in with a seatbelt so he touched the pilot with the tips of his fingers touched him on the chest and could feel nothing no heartbeat no rise and fall of breathing which meant that the pilot was almost certainly dead Please, Brian said, but did not know what or, what or who to ask. Please! The plane lurched again, hit more turbulence, and Brian felt the nose drop. It did not die, but the nose went down slightly, and the down angle increased the speed, and he knew that at this angle, this slight angle down, he would ultimately fly into the trees. He could see them ahead on the horizon, where before he could only see sky. He had to fly it somehow, had to fly the plane. He had to help himself. The pilot was gone. Beyond anything he could do, he had to try and fly the plane. He turned back in the seat, facing the front, and put his hands, still trembling, on the control wheel, his feet gently on the rudder pedals. He pulled back on the stick to raise the plane. He knew that from reading. He al You always pull back on the wheel. He gave it a tug, and it slid back toward him easily too easily. The plane, with the increased speed from the tilt down, swooped eagerly up and drove Brian's stomach down. He pushed the wheel back in, went too far this time, and the plane's nose went back, went below the horizon, and the engine speed increased with the shallow dive. Too much. He pulled it back again, more gently this time, and the nose floated up again, too far, but not as violently as before. Then down a bit too much and up again as before. Then down a bit too much and then up again very easily. And the front of the engine cowling settled. When he had it aimed at the horizon and it seemed to be steady, he held the wheel where it was, let out a breath, which he had been holding all this time, and tried to think what to do next. It was a clear blue sky day with fluffy bits of clouds here and there. And he looked out the window for a moment, hoping to see something, a town or village, but there was nothing, just the green of the trees, endless green, and the lake scattered more and more thickly as the plane flew. Where? He was flying but did not know where, had no idea where he was going. He looked at the dashboard of the plane, studied the dials, and hoped to get some help. Hoped to find a compass, but it was all so confusing. A jumble of numbers and lights. One lighted display in the top center of the dashboard said the number 342. Another next to it said 22. Down beneath that, that were dials with lines that seemed to indicate what the winds were doing, tipping or moving. And one dial with a needle pointing to the number 70, which he thought only thought might be the altimeter. 
the device that told him his height about the ground, above the ground, or above sea level. Somewhere he had read something about altimeters, but he couldn't remember what or where or anything about them. Slightly to the left and below the altimeter, he saw a small rectangular panel with a lighted dial and two knobs. His eyes had passed it over two or three times before he saw what was written in tiny letters on top of the panel. Transmitter 221 was stamped in the metal, and it hit him, finally, that this was the radio. The radio, of course! He had, he had to use the radio when the pilot had, had been hit that way. He couldn't bring himself to say that the pilot was dead. Couldn't think of it. He had been trying to use the radio. Brian looked at the pilot. The headset was still on his head, turned sideways a bit from his jamming back into the seat, and the microphone switch was clipped onto his belt. Brian had to get the headset from the pilot, had to reach over and get the headset from the pilot, or he would not be able to use the radio to call for help. He had to reach over. His hands began trembling again. He did not want to touch the pilot, did not want to reach for him. But he had to had to get to the radio. He lifted his hands from the wheel just slightly and held them waiting to see what would happen. The plane flew on normally, smoothly. All right, he thought. Now, now do this thing. He turned and reached for the headset, slid it from the pilot's head, one eye on the plane, waiting it for, for it to dive. The headset came easily, but the microphone switch on the pilot's belt was jammed in and he had to pull it, pull to get it loose. When he pulled, his elbow bumped the wheel and pushed it in, and the plane started down in a shallow dive. Brian grabbed the wheel and pulled it back too hard, and the plane went through another series of stomach-wrenching swoops up and down before he could get it under control. When things had settled again, he pulled at the mic cord once more and at last jerked the cord free. It took him another second or two to place the headset on his own head and position the small microphone tube in front of his mouth. He had seen the pilot use it, had seen him depress the switch on its, at, at his belt, so Brian pushed the switch in and blew into the mic. He heard the sound of his breath in the headset. Hello? Is there anybody listening on this? Hello? He repeated it two or three times and then waited, but nothing, heard nothing except his own breathing. Panic came then. He had been afraid, had been stopped with the terror of what was happening, but now panic came and he began to scream into the microphone scream over and over help somebody help me I'm in this plane and don't know don't know don't know and he started crying with the screams crying and slamming his hands against the wheel of the plane causing it to jerk down then back up but again he heard nothing but the sound of his own sobs in the microphone his own screams mocking him coming back into his ears the microphone awareness cut into him he had used a CB radio in his uncle's pickup once. You had to turn the mic switch off to hear anybody else. He reached to his belt and released the switch. For a second, all he heard was the whoosh of the empty airwaves. Then, through the noise and static, he heard a voice. Whoever is calling on this radio, Nat, I repeat, release your mic switch. You are covering me. You are covering me. Over. It stopped, and Brian hit his mic switch. I hear you. I hear you. This is me. He released the switch. Roger, I have you now. The voice was very faint and breaking up. Please state your difficulty and location and say over to signal. End of tr transmission. Over. Please state my difficulty, Brian thought. God, my difficulty? I'm in a plane with a pilot who is, he can't fly, and I don't know how to fly. Help me. Help. He turned his mic off without ending transmission properly. There was a moment's hesitation before the answer. Your signal is breaking up and I lost most of it. Understand? Pilot, you can't fly, correct? Over? Brian could barely hear him now, heard mostly noise and static. That's right, I can't fly. The plane is flying now, but I don't know how much longer. Over. Lost signal. Your location, please. Flight number. Location. Ver... I don't know my flight number or location. I don't know anything. I told you that. Over. He waited now. Waited, but there was nothing. Once for a second, he thought he heard a break in the noise, some part of a word, but it could have been static. Two, three minutes, ten minutes, and the plane roared, and Brian listened, but heard no one. Then he hit the switch again, 
I do not know the flight number. My name is Brian Robeson, and we left Hampton, New York, headed for the Canadian oil fields to visit my father, and I do not know how to fly an airplane, and the pilot, he let go of the mic, his voice was starting to rattle, and he felt as if he might start screaming at any second. He took a deep breath. If there is anybody listening who can help me fly a plane, please answer. Again, he released the mic, but heard nothing but the hissing of noise in the headset. After half an hour of listening and repeating the cry for help, he tore the headset off in frustration and threw it to the floor. It all seemed so hopeless. Even if he did get somebody, what could anybody do? Tell him to be careful? All so hopeless. He tried to figure out the dials again. He thought he might know which was speed. It was a lighted number that read 160, and he didn't know if that was actual miles an hour or kilometers, or if it just meant how fast the plane was moving through the air and not over the ground. He knew airspeed was different when ground, from ground speed, but not by how much. Parts of books he'd read about flying came to him, how wings worked, how the propellers pulled the plane through the sky, simple things that, he wouldn't, that wouldn't help him now. Nothing could help him. An hour passed, he picked up he picked up the headset and tried again. It was, he knew, in, in the end, all he had, but there was no answer. He felt like a prisoner, kept in a small cell that was hurtling through the sky at what he thought to be 160 miles an hour, headed, he didn't know where, just headed somewhere until. There it was. Until what? Until he ran out of fuel. When the plane ran out of fuel, it would go down. Period. Or he could pull the throttle out and make it go down now. He had seen the pilot push the throttle in to increase speed. If he pulled the throttle back out, the plane would slow down and the plane would go down. Those were his choices. He could wait for the plane to run out of gas or and fall, or he could push the throttle in and make it happen sooner. If he waited for the plane to run out of fuel, he could go farther. But he did not know which way he was moving. When the pilot had jerked, he had moved the plane, but Brian could not remember how much or if it had come back to its original course. Since he did not know the original course anyway and could only guess at which display might be the compass, the only reading, 342, he did not know where he had been or where he was going, so it didn't make much difference if he went down now or waited. Everything in him rebelled against stopping the engine and falling now. He had a vague feeling that he was wrong to keep heading up as the plane was heading, a feeling that he might be going off in the wrong direction, but he could not bring himself to stop the engine and fall. Now he was safe, or safer than if he went down. The plane was flying and he was still breathing. When the engine stopped, he would go down. So he left the plane running, holding altitude and kept trying the radio. He worked out a system. Every 10 minutes by the small clock built into the dashboard, he tried to radio with a simple message. I need help. Is there anybody listening to me? In the times between transmissions, he tried to prepare himself for, for what he knew was coming. When he ran out of fuel, the plane would start down. He guessed that without the propeller pulling, propeller pulling, he would have to push the nose down to keep the plane flying. He thought he may have read that somewhere or it just came to him. Either way, it made sense. He would have to push the nose down to keep flying speed and then, just before he hit, he would have to pull the nose back up to slow the plane as much as possible. It all made sense. Glide down, then slow the plane and hit. Hit. He would have to find a clearing as he went down. The problem with that was that he hadn't seen one clearing since they'd started flying over the forest. Some swamps, but they had trees scattered through them. No roads, no trails, no clearings. Just the lakes, and it came to him that he would have to use a lake for landing. If he landed down in the trees, he was certain to die. The trees would tear the plane to pieces as it went into them. He would have to come down in a lake. No, on the edge of a lake. He would have to come down near the edge of a lake and try to slow the plane as much as possible just before he hit the water. Easy to say, he thought. Hard to do. Easy say, hard do. Easy say, hard do. It became a chant that beat with the engine. Easy say, hard do. Impossible to do. 
He repeated the radio call 17 times at 10 minute intervals, working on what he would do between transmissions. Once more, he reached over to the pilot and touched him on the face, but the skin was cold, hard, uh, death cold, and Brian turned back to the dashboard. He did what he could, straightened his seatbelt, positioned himself, rehearsed mentally again and again what his procedure should be. When the plane ran out of gas, he would he should hold the nose down and head for the nearest lake and try to fly the plane kind of into the water, onto the water. That's how he thought it, of it. Kind of fly the plane onto the water. And just before it hit, he should pull back on the wheel and slow the plane to reduce the impact. Over and over, his mind ran the picture of how it would go. The plane running out of gas, flying the plane onto the crash water, the crash from pictures he'd seen on television. He tried to visualize it. He tried to be ready. But between the 17th and 18th radio transmissions, without a warning, the engine coughed, roared violently for a second, and died. There was a sudden silence, cut only by the sound of the wind milling propeller, and the wind passed the cockpit. Brian pushed the nose of the plane down and threw up. Chapter 3. Going to Die. Brian thought, going to die, going to die. His whole brain screamed in the, in the sudden silence, gonna die. He wiped his mouth with the back of his arm and he held the nose. The plane went into a glide, a very fast glide that ate altitude and suddenly there weren't any lakes. All he'd seen since they started flying over the forest was lakes and now they were gone, gone. Out in, in front, far away at the horizon, he could see lots of them glittering blue in the late afternoon sun but he needed one right in front of him. He desperately needed a lake in right in front of the plane, and all he saw through the windshield were trees, green death trees. If he had to turn, if he had to turn, he didn't think he would keep he could keep the plane flying. His stomach tightened into a series of rolling knots, and his breath came in short bursts. There, not quite in front, but slightly to the right, he saw a lake. L-shaped with rounded corners, and the lake was nearly aimed at the long part of the L, coming from the bottom and heading to the top, just a tiny bit to the right. He pushed the right rudder pe pedal gently, and the nose moved under over. But the turn cost him speed, and now the lake was above the nose. He pulled back on the wheel slightly, and the nose came up. This paw caused the plane to slow dramatically and almost seemed to stop and wallow in the, in the air. The controls became very loose feeling and frightened Brian, making him push the wheel back in. This increased the speed a bit, but filled the windshield once more with nothing but trees and put the lake well above the nose and out of reach. For a space of three or four seconds, things seemed to hang almost to a stop. The plane was fought flying, but so slowly, so slowly, it would never reach the lake. Brian looked out to the side and saw a small pond, and at the edge of the, of the pond, some large animals. He thought mooses standing out in the water, all so still looking, so stopped. The pond and the moose and the trees, as he slid over them now, only three or four hundred feet off the ground, all like a picture. And everything happened at once. Trees suddenly took on detail, filled his whole field of vision with green, and he knew he would hit and die, would die, but his luck held. And just as he was to hit, he came into an open lane, and a channel of fallen trees, a wide place leading to the lake. The plane, committed now to landing, to crashing, fell into the wide place like a stone, and Brian eased back on the wheel and braced himself for the crash. But there was a tiny bit of speed left, and when he pulled on the wheel, the nose came up and he saw in front the blue of the lake, and at that instant the plane hit the trees. There was a great wrenching as the wings caught the pines at the side of the clearing and broke back ripping back just outside the main braces. Dust and dirt flew off the floor into his face so hard he thought there must have been some kind of explosion. He was momentarily blinded and slammed forward in the seat, smashing his head on the wheel. Then a wild crashing sound, ripping of metal, and the plane rolled to the right and blew through the trees, out of the water and down, down to slam into the lake, out over the water, and down, down to slam into the lake. Skip once on the on water 
as hard as con concrete. Water that tore the windshield out and shattered the side windows. Water that drove him back into the seat. Somebody was screaming as the plane drove down into the water. Someone screamed tight animal screams of fear and pain, and he did not know that it was his sound, that he roared against the water that took him and the plane still deeper down into the water. He saw nothing but sensed blue, cold blue-green, and he raked at the seatbelt catch, tore his nails loose on one hand. He ripped at it until it released, and somehow the water trying to kill him, to end him, somehow he pulled himself out of the shattered front window and clawed up into the blue. Something felt something hold him back, felt his windbreaker tear, and he was free, tearing free, ripping free. But so far, and so far to the surface, his lungs could not do this thing, could not hold and worth and were through, and he sucked water, took a great pull of water that could, that would finally win, finally take him, and his head broke into light, and he vomited and swam, pulling without knowing what he was, what he was, what he was doing, without knowing anything, pulling until his hands caught at weeds and muck, pulling and screaming until his hands caught at last in grass and brush, and he felt his chest on land, felt his face in the coarse blades of grass, and he stopped. Everything stopped. A color came that he had never seen before. A color that exploded in his mind with the pain, and he was gone, gone from it all, spiraling out into the world, spiraling out into nothing. Nothing. Chapter 4. The memory was like a knife cutting into him, slicing deep into him with hate, the secret. He had been riding his 10-speed with a friend named Terry, they had been taking a run on a bike trail and decided to come back a different way, a way that took him pa took them past the Amber Mall. Brian remembered everything in incredible detail. Remembered the time on the bank clock in the mall flashing 331, then the temperature 82, and the date. All the numbers were part of the memory. All of his life were part of the memory. Terry had just turned to smile at him about something, and Brian looked over Terry's head and saw her, his mother. She was sitting in a station wagon, a strange wagon. He saw her and she did not see him. Brian was going to wave or call out, but something stopped him. There was a man in the car, short blonde hair, the man, wearing some kind of pullover tennis shirt. Brian saw this and more, saw the secret and saw more later, but the memory came in pieces, came in scenes like this, Terry smiling. Brian looked over his head to see the station wagon and his mother sitting with the man, the time and temperature clock, the front wheel of his bike, the short blonde hair of the man, the white shirt of the man, the hot hate slices of the memory were exact, the secret. Brian opened his eyes and screamed. For seconds, he did not know where he was, only that the crash was still happening and he was going to die, and he screamed until his breath was gone. Then silence, filled with sobs as he pulled in air, half crying, how could it be so quiet? Moments ago, there was nothing but noise, crashing and tearing, screaming. Now, quiet. Some birds were singing. How could birds be singing? His legs felt wet, and he raised up on his hands and looked back down at them. They were in the lake. Strange. They went down into the water. He tried to move, but pain hammered into him and made his breath shorten into gasps, and he stopped, his legs still in the water. Pain memory. He turned again and the sun came across the water, late sun, cut into his eyes and made him turn away. It was over then, the crash. He was alive. The crash is over and I am alive, he thought. Then his eyes closed and he lowered his head for minutes that seemed longer. When he opened them again, it was evening and some of the sharp pain had abated. There were many dull aches and the crash came back to him fully into the trees and out onto the lake. The plane had crashed and sunk in the lake, and he had somehow pulled himself free. He raised himself and crawled out of the water, grunting with the pain of movement. His legs were on fire, and his forehead felt as if someone had been pounding on it with a hammer, but he could move. He pulled his legs out of the lake and crawled on his hands and knees until he was away from the wet, soft shore and near a small stand of brush of some kind.
Then he went down, only this time to rest, to save something of himself. He lay on his side and put his head on his arm and closed his eyes because that was all he could do, all he could think of being able to do. He closed his eyes and slept, dreamless, deep and down. There was almost no light when he opened his eyes again. The darkness of night was thick, and for a moment he began to panic. He, to see, he thought, to see is everything, and he could not see. But his head, but he turned his head without moving his body and saw that across the lake the sky was a light gray, that the sun was starting to come up, and he remembered that it had been evening when he went to sleep. Must be morning now. He mumbled it, almost in a hoarse whisper. As the thickness of sleep left him, the world came back. He was still in pain, all over pain. His legs were cramped and drawn up, tight and aching, and his back hurt when he tried to move. Worse was the keening throb in his head that pulsed with every beat of his heart. It seemed that the whole crash had happened to his head. He rolled on his back and felt his sides and his legs moving things slowly. He rubbed his arms. Nothing seemed to be shattered or even sprained all that badly. When he was nine, he had plowed his small dirt bike into a parked car and broken his ankle, had to wear a cast for eight weeks, and there was nothing now like that. Nothing broken, just battered around a bit. His forehead felt massively swollen to the touch, almost like a mound mound out over his eyes, and it was so tender that when his fingers grazed it, he could cry, but there was nothing he could do about it, and like the rest of him, it seemed to be bruised more than broken. I'm alive, he thought. I'm alive. It could have been different. There could have been death. I could have been done. Like the pilot, he thought suddenly. The pilot in the plane, down into the water, down into the blue water, strapped in the sea. He sat up, or tried to. The first time, he fell back. But at the second attempt, grunting with effort, he managed to come to a sitting position and scrunch sideways until his back was against a small tree where he sat facing the lake, watching the sky get lighter and lighter with the coming dawn. His clothes were wet and clammy, and there was a faint chill. He pulled the torn remnants of his windbreaker, piece, windbreaker pieces, really, around his shoulders, and tried to hold what body what heat his body could find. He could not think, could not make thought patterns work right. Things seemed to go back and forth between reality and imagination, except that it was all reality. One second, he seemed only to have imagined that there was a plane crash, that he had fought out of the sinking plane and swum to shore, that it had all happened to some other person or in a movie playing in his mind. Then he would feel his clothes wet and cold and his forehead would slash a pain through his thoughts. And he would know it was real, that it had really happened, but all in a haze, all in a haze world. So he sat and stared at the lake, felt the pain come and go in waves and watched the sun come over the end of the lake. It took an hour, perhaps two. He could not measure time yet and didn't care for the sun to get halfway up. With it came some warmth, small bites, of it at first, and with the heat came clouds of insects, thick swarming hordes of mosquitoes that flocked to his body, made a living coat on his exposed skin, clogged his nostrils when he inhaled, poured into his mouth when he opened it to take a breath. It was not possibly, it was not possibly believable. Not this. He had come through the crash, but the insects were not possible. He coughed them up, spat them out, sneezed them out, closed his eyes and kept brushing his face, slapping and crushing them by the dozens, by the hundreds. But as soon as he cleared a place, as soon as he killed them, more came. Thick, whining, buzzing masses of them. Mosquitoes and some black flies he had never seen before, all biting, chewing, taking from him. In moments, his eyes were swollen shut and his face puffy and round to match his battered forehead. He pulled the torn pieces of his windbreaker over his head and tried to shelter an inch, shelter in it, but the jacket was full of rips, and it didn't work. In desperation, he pulled his t-shirt up to cover his face, but that exposed the skin on his lower back, and the mosquitoes and flies attacked the new soft flesh of his back so viciously that he pulled the shirt down. In the end, he sat with the windbreaker pulled up, brushed with his hands, and shook it. 
almost crying in frustration and agony. There was nothing left to do. And when the sun was fully up and heating him directly, bringing steam off of his wet clothes and bathing him in warmth, the mosquitoes and flies disappeared. Almost that suddenly, one minute he was sitting in the middle of a swarm, the next they were gone and the sun was on him. Vampires, he thought. Apparently they didn't like the deep of night perhaps because it was too cool and they couldn't take the direct sunlight. But in that gray time in the morning, when it began to get warm and before the sun was full up and hot, he couldn't believe them. Never in all the reading in the movies had he watched on television about the outdoors. Never once had they ever mentioned the mosquitoes or flies. All they ever showed on the naturalist shows was beautiful scenery or animals jumping around having a good time. Nobody ever mentioned mosquitoes or flies. Ah, oh, he pulled himself up to stand against the tree and stretch, bringing new aches and pains. His back muscles must have been hurt as well. They almost seemed to tear when he stretched. And while the pain in his forehead seemed to be abating somewhat, just trying to stand made him weak enough to nearly collapse. The back of his hands were puffy and his eyes were almost swollen shut from the mosquitoes and he saw everything through a narrow squint. Not that there was much to see, he thought, scratching the bites. In front of him lay the lake, blue and deep. He had a sudden picture of the plane sunk in the lake, down and down in the blue, with the pilot's body still strapped in the seat, his hair waving. He shook his head, more pain. That wasn't something to think about. He looked at his surroundings again. The lake stretched out slightly below him. He was at the base of the L, looking up the long part with the short part out to his right. In the morning light and calm, the water was absolutely perfectly still. He could see the reflections of the trees at the other end of the lake, upside down in the water that seemed almost like another forest, an upside down forest to match the real one. As he watched a large bird, he thought it looked like a crow, but it seemed larger, flew from the top, real forest, and the reflection bird matched it, flying over out over the water. Everything was green, so green it went into him. The forest was largely made up of pines and spruce, with stands of some low brush smeared here and there in thick grass, and some other kind of very small brush all over. He couldn't identify most of it except the evergreens and some leafy trees he thought might be aspen. He'd seen pictures of aspens in the mountains on television. The country around the lake was moderately hilly, but the hills were small and almost, almost hummocks, and there were very few rocks except to his left. There lay a rocky ridge that stuck out over the lake, about 20 feet high. If the plane had come down a little to the left, it would have hit the rocks and never made the lake. He would have smashed, destroyed, the word came again. I would have been destroyed and torn and smashed, driven into the rocks and destroyed. Luck, he thought. I have luck. I have good luck there. But he knew that was wrong. If he had had good luck, his parents wouldn't have divorced because of the secret, and he wouldn't have been flying with a pilot who had a heart a heart attack, and he would be, wouldn't be here where he had to have good luck to keep from being destroyed. If you keep walking back from good luck, he thought, you'll have some bad luck. He shook his head again, wincing. Another thing not to think about. The rocky ridge was rounded and seemed to be seemed to be of some kind of sandstone with bits of darker stone layered and stuck into it. Directly across the lake from it, at the inside corner of the L, was a mound of sticks and mud rising up out of the water a good eight or ten feet. At first, Brian couldn't place but knew that somehow knew what it was, had seen it in films, then a small brown head popped to the surface of the water near the mound and began swimming off down the short leg of the L, leaving a V of ripples behind, and he remembered where he'd seen it. It was a beaver house, called the Beaver Lodge, in a special he had seen on the public channel. A fish jumped, not a large fish, but it made a big splash near the beaver, and as if by signal there were suddenly little spl 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 oh my God, splot, all over the side of the lake, along the shore, a fish beginning to jump, hundreds of them jumping and slapping the water. Brian watched them for a time, still in, a, in the half daze. 
still not thinking well. The scenery was pr very pretty, he thought, and there were new things to look at, but it was all green and blue blur, and he was used to the, the gray and black of the city. Traffic, people talking, sounds all the time, the hum and whine of the city. Here, at first, it was silent, or, th or he thought it was silent, and when he started to listen, really listen, he could hear thousands of things, hisses and blurks, small sounds, birds singing, hum of insects, splashes from the fish jumping. There was great noise here, but a noise he did not know, and the colors were new to him, and the colors and noise mixed in his mind to make a blue-green blur he could hear. Here as a hissing pulse sound and was still tired, so tired, so awfully tired and standing had taken a lot of energy somehow, had drained him. He supposed he was still in some kind of shock from the crash and there was still the pain, the dizziness, the strange feeling. He found another tree, a small pine with no branches until the top. And he sat with his back against it, looking down on the lake with the sun warming him. And in a few moments, he scrunched down and was asleep again. And we're going to stop there until we meet again. Have a good day.